off. Recording now. Your mic is on. Go ahead and shut it off as well. As you. All right. Connect so, into audio. What do I do now? See, you have to relay Sam there. Let's see. You hearing anything? No, Hi. it's just it, it tells you that it's connecting. Um, are you going to mute question. everybody, Christina? Yeah, I am trying to find. I'm hearing something now. Here we go. I found him. Okay. Very low. Yeah, put in your ear and You might hear it. Weird. Um, can are you able to find them? What is it? You just I don't hear what he's saying. I can't. I don't appear to be able to mute. Yeah, I, uh, Violet Clark, can you please uh, mute yourself? What's my name? Yeah, Violet Clark. Can you please mute yourself? She said, "Welcome." Nancy, can you do me a favor? Um, uh -huh. Actually, what I'm going to do is going to click on mute all, and then I'll unmute you. Sound good? Okay. All right. Okay. There. What's it? Nancy, were you able to unmute? Sent you the request. Me. Okay. How's that? Very good. Okay. Great, great, great. We can get started. I'm here. Are you? I'm here. Yeah. I don't know what. Um. Yeah, we are not able to mute them. I don't, I'm not understanding why either. Yeah, that, that, that option is not there. That's very interesting. Um, sounds like a glitch with. Webex. I don't know why that why that came up. Uh, click that on, I guess. I'm gonna uh, do. No. No, that's not what you want, Rita. Um. Um, Violet Clark, I'm very sorry if you could, I'm going to boot you and then if you could log back in. I hear the talking, but I can't hear what you're saying. I can't hear you too well. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm going to boot you and then if you would go ahead and log back in. It actually. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Something is not going right. Okay. Okay, so this is a lot. Welcome everybody. <laughs> I'm so sorry for that. Thank you so much for waiting. Uh, we are gonna get started right now. So I'm Christina, I work with Fort Bend County Libraries and I appreciate you all being here. Thank you for joining us for the Landscape Success Series. Today's workshop is Controlling Landscape Pests and Diseases. Presenting today are Master Gardeners, Nancy Schaefer and Dan Lawler. Nancy grew up on a farm in West Central Texas. There she gardened with family, especially her grandmother, and everywhere else she has lived. Gardening has been a source of pleasure, food, and beauty, as well as physical and mental wellness her whole life. She has been a Fort Benning Master Gardener since 2004. She feels the Master Gardening Program is important because it provides a chance to learn about gardening, to teach community members about gardening, and to make new friends. Uh, Dan Lawler is a retired instructor of agriculture and biology at Wharton County Junior College and Lone Star College Kingwood. Uh, Dan received his PhD degree in agronomy, crops and, crops and soils, excuse me, at Kansas State University and has been a Texas master gardener since the fall of 2000. And now I turn it over to you, Nancy. Okay. Share content, right? Whoops, wrong one. Oh, should I go to? Gotta go back. 
connected. Okay, where do I share? Down here? Oh, okay, here we are. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I put this first slide up because I would like for the audience members to be sure that they have the Fort Bend County Master Gardener website address. You can take a picture of the screen or you can jot it down. And then today we're going to be talking a lot about insects and diseases. So you maybe want may want to use our hotline phone number or um, our website. The hotline phone number is listed there. You can write that down. If you go to uh, fbmg.org, you can choose contact us and it will give you a form to fill out where you can put a picture, write down a question, uh, give us some information and we will get back to you. Nancy, Nancy we I don't can see you. your slides. Yeah. Oh, you're not seeing my slides? Oh. No, not yet. Okay. Um, I, I'm seeing my slides, but you are not. Okay. Yeah. Still not. Shay. I can't see my slides. One moment, please. This went really smoothly during rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> Where do I share? Um, over here. Suma, do you happen to have the the information that she was referring to? I did. Okay. But right, that's not Think. it. Yeah. Not what I want. <coughs> so maybe now you can start the slideshow. Yeah. Yeah. Go back to. Oh, but I don't want this on the side. Oh, once you start the slideshow and say from the beginning, that will disappear, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Excellent. Now you're in business. All right. Okay. So we did that. I, I talked about that. But if you want to write the, the website down and if you want to uh, get the phone number down, you can write those down now. Um, we do have master gardeners that are working on the hotline, so they can return your call. Uh, it would be during the week, though. Okay, now let's talk about uh, in landscape success. I know that you've, you've, if you've been to any or listened to any of the, of the rest of these, you've talked about soils, you've talked about um, irrigation, a lot of things. This is about a program called IPM. It's a nationwide program, um, and it is an environmentally friendly way, um, friendly common sense approach to controlling pests. <clears throat> when we define pest, we are um, when we uh, are talking about pests, we are talking about an insect or other arthropod that would be a spider or a mite plant disease, a weed, or an other, another organism that negatively affects plant health and becomes an annoyance to people or pests. That could include a lot of things. Okay, I'm not able to go to the next slide now. And so you might try um, just pressing the arrow key. That's what I'm doing, but it's not doing anything. And if you click it, does it do anything? Nancy, try a, a right, a, a left click on your mouse or scroll down on your mouse. I can't move to the next screen. Go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Are you rolling it? 
Okay, we'll do it this way. Okay, so the key concepts in, in uh, IPM are to scout and monitor. Picture yourself in your garden early in the morning, or late in the evening when you come back from work. You're going to walk around. You're going to look for pests. You're going to look for damages um, and make a note of that in your brain. Uh, you want to be sure if you find something, you are able to identify it once you've found it. So take a picture, capture it, that sort of thing. You will next want to recognize and diagnose the damage this thing is doing to your plants. You'll determine, is this bad enough that I really need to do something about it? Or do I want to check in a couple of days and see how it looks? And then you'll be able to use some of the IPM practices, which we're going to go through. And uh, we're going to see what, um, uh, what you can do. So one of the things is to plant the right plant in the right place. And I think you probably have, if you've watched any of the others of these, you've probably uh, seen uh, something about this. Um, a plant that needs to grow in the sun will not grow in the shade. A plant that needs to grow in the shade will not grow in the sun. So you've got to find, do your research. I know that a lot of us go to the nursery. We look at plants. We see something pretty. We buy it. We get home. We don't know anything about it. We plant it. We're not successful. So let's do some research. Read the plant tag. There's a little tag in the plant, uh, should be, where you can find out what zones it grows in, uh, what kind of soil it needs, what kind of uh, uh, sunlight it needs, that kind of thing. Those are good places to start. If you're not ready to buy, take a picture of that, come home, do some research on it. Uh, uh, if you're planting from seed, a packet of seed, turn it over on the back, and you've got a lot of information that tells you about when to plant it in the zone that you're in. You are in zone 9A if you are in Fort Bend County, and uh, it tells you about how deep to plant it, tells you what it's resistant to. These letters are a code, and if you don't know what the code means, you can look that up uh, online also. Um, when you search for information online, you want to be sure that you uh, search carefully. Um, you don't want to search in a place where somebody's trying to sell you something. You want to go to a university. Texas A&M Extension is a good place to look. Uh, these are some helpful documents if you're th thinking about planting a fall garden. If you want to take a picture of that, or we can probably put that in the uh, chat. Uh, those are good references for vegetables. So for vegetable crops, um, if you want to limit some problems, you can um, do what we call crop rotation. Uh, farmers have been doing this for a long, long time, but uh, gardeners can do it too. What you want to do is rotate where you plant your plants and don't plant the same family in the same spot every year or maybe even every season. So if you've got a three, three plots in your garden, on year one, you might plant a tomato one, or tomatoes in one spot. You might wanna plant legumes, beans and peas, those kinds of things in another spot. And the next spot you would plant the carrot. The next year you switch around, you plant the carrot in the first spot, the tomato in the next spot, the legume or the beans and peas in the next spot. That way you don't have any soil borne diseases um, that are attacking plants uh, and uh, that, that eliminates some of the problems. Tomatoes, peppers, eggplant are all in the same family. The legumes are the beans and peas. Carrots are the root crops. Carrots, radishes, beets, turnips, that sort of thing. They are not in the same family, but they are affected by the same root diseases. So you would want to move those around. Uh, if you have a variety of plants in your, um, uh, in your garden, you will have a much more, uh, much more luck with your garden and you'll have a healthier habitat. Planting of one variety attracts more pests and allows diseases to spread quickly. If you've ever planted three, plant, three tomato plants in a row, if one of them got spider mites, they all got spider mites. So you need to mix it up a little bit. Another thing we can think about here, 
is that surprise freeze we had this year. If you had all the same kind of shrubs like Indian hawthorn planted in your front yard, they all froze. So now you've got either to replace them or wait for them to return. So mixing things up a little bit, keeping in mind that they need to be growing where they like to grow, uh, that's a good idea. Think about microclimates in your garden. Uh, how much sun does this spot get? How much water? If there's not a sprinkler out there or if you're going to have to drag a hose a long way, you might want to consider that too. What are the nutrients like there? Is this a really hard clay uh, that I'm going to have to do something to to make the plant healthy? Um, so you're going to think about nutrients in the soil. You're going to think about the soil itself. So look for those kinds of things before you plant the plant. So these are some practices that we normally suggest that you go through. Um, some of the things that you can do for uh, pests in your garden is uh, one of the things is put out traps. These are small cards about the size of an insect uh, of an index card. Um, yellow and blue seem to be the colors that insects are more attracted to. Uh, the one, this one on the uh, the uh, right is uh, probably has pheromones in it, which is sort of like a smell that maybe uh, would attract insects. It's easy to make your own. If you take it like a sandwich bag, put it for this one, put a yellow card in it. On the outside, you'll want to rub either spray some uh, cooking spray like you spray on your pans to keep things from sticking or uh, you can use Vaseline, put a thin coating of Vaseline on the card front and back, punch a hole in it, hang it in your garden from a stick or uh, something like that. And then you can see what kind of insects are there. This will also attract beneficial insects. So you wanna think about that too, but it's really helpful for, attract, for uh, counting and seeing the small insects that you have. You can do hand picking. Uh, I prefer not to do it with my fingers, but some people don't mind. So put on a pair of gloves. Uh, you've probably got some of these blue things hanging around the house from COVID. So those are pretty good to use for this. Get a cup uh, of some kind. I prefer one with a handle on it. Put some water in it. Put a few drops, three, four drops of soap in it. Walk around your garden. When you see something big enough, you can swipe it into the cup. That will... The soap will uh, suffocate the insect. You can take it back in the house. You can put them on a paper towel, look at them, take pictures of them, that sort of thing, and start with the identification process. Another way uh, of controlling pests is to use sprays of water. This is good for aphids. It's good for spider mites, that sort of thing. Um, you want to be aware uh, that there are beneficial insects that are probably in the group of aphids that you're seeing. So you're going to wash those away too. Also, if you're a butterfly gardener, you may wash away uh, the eggs and the tiny caterpillars from butterflies. Barriers are things like uh, row covers that you can buy. They're non-woven. Uh, a lot of them are. Uh, and those will keep insects from getting on your crops. You can see this is a big garden. If you wanted to do it in your garden uh, and you just have something small you think you want to cover up, then uh, you could go to the fabric store and buy a, pro a fabric called Tool, T-U-L-L-E. -L -L -E. It's what you make uh, bridal veils out of. Um, and you can make, it's not expensive at all. You can make some small covers to cover up things in your garden uh, if you want to do that. Also cups like uh, plastic cups, styrofoam cups, cans. Uh, you can use things that you're gonna throw out like yogurt cups, uh, that sort of thing. And you can use those uh, for your plants. Cut out the top and bottom. You stick them about an inch into the soil, not too far into the soil because you don't want to hamper the growth of roots. Um, and uh, you also want to think about removing it. So you may want to slit it down the side to make it easier to remove after you um, uh, after the plant gets a little bit bigger. This helps control uh, insects that would crawl upon the plant from the soil, like cutworms. 
And this one uh, picture down at the bottom, if you've got a plant that looks like this, that's got so many insects on it, this is a scale insect, uh, you might wanna consider removing it. And we'll see some more pictures like this as we go through this. Uh, if a plant just has a leaf like the one uh, on the right, you may want to um, just remove that leaf and don't drop it on the ground. You need to throw it away because uh, this is a fungus. It can come from the soil. It can come from the air, but you want to get it out of the garden. Okay, the other thing is biologic, another thing is biological product. Uh, practices. That was mechanical. This is biological. First thing I would suggest is that we all try to protect the habitats of the natural enemies of pests, like other beneficial insects. Birds, uh, spiders are great at capturing things. Uh, the little animals that we have uh, and, the, uh, and the little frogs that are in our yard. Um, earthworms, all of those kinds of things are very helpful and would be considered a biological uh, practice. Uh, you can, some of you may have noticed that you can buy beneficial insects online. They are for sale at nursery centers uh, you, and, at, and online. They are used more often by commercial growers and um, people who have greenhouses, but homeowners can do it too. Uh, they may be costly depending on what you're buying. Um, the live insects, if you buy live insects, may not stay in your garden. They may go to your neighbor or somewhere else. Even if you buy eggs, those may not stay just in your garden. So parasitic wasps, which are probably one of the best uh, beneficial insects we have as far as uh, taking care of pests. Lacewings, lady beetles, beneficial nematodes are all some things that are available. I would do a little research on this before you do it. Uh, as master gardeners, uh, we have uh, been in situations where we have noticed that live, butter, uh, live uh, lady beetles do not stay. So biological pe uh, products for best pest control. These are like the pesticides that we used to use, similar. Bacillus thuringiensis is uh, a bacteria and uh, these products, uh, Bt is actually the bacteria. Um, it has to be eaten by the insect to be effective. So it has to get into their gut in order to kill them. Um, it, there are several strains of it. Uh, BT is usually what um, we see on the strain that's for, back, for mosquitoes. You can get this in dunks or little granules, uh, which I find to be a little bit uh, easier to, uh, to use. A lot of times you don't need a whole dunk, you just need a few granules. Um, and it also comes in a liquid. Um, it is effective on mosquitoes, the little biting black flies that, that uh, develop in water and drain flies that you might find in your house. Although flushing your drain good uh, usually works to get rid of that. You can use these in uh, standing water, bird baths, plant saucers, that sort of thing. And it, if you use the granules, it doesn't take very much. BTK and BTA, and this would be on the label or for controlling caterpillars. There'll also be a picture of a caterpillar on the, on the label. It's available to be mixed with water or it can be uh, maybe in a, like a spray bottle. Uh, usually uh, mixing it with water is better. You will notice when you buy uh, these liquid products, they're gonna be in a small container. They don't last forever, so uh, so that's why it is. Follow instructions on mixing them. It's um, and it it will last a day or two after you mix it up, but you probably should uh, should uh, not use it any longer than that. Um, the BTK and BTA are will also kill your butterfly car caterpillar, so you want to be uh, careful where you use it. There are three BT products that are effective on beetle larva. You have to know which larva you are targeting um, to use those. Okay, this is the red box and it goes with biological and chemical pesticides. 
you want to be sure that you read and follow directions, read and follow directions. I could say that about five more times because it's the most important thing to remember whenever you're using uh, a pesticide. Don't change the amounts. If it says a gallon of water in one tablespoon, don't try to. You wouldn't try that when you were making a cake. So don't do that. Mix it like it says to. Use the product only on the targeted pest. Uh, if you are trying to discourage or, or get rid of, uh, say, uh, spider mites uh, and the product is for caterpillars, it won't work. You use, should use gloves and a mask. Um, don't inhale the product. Uh, if you can smell it, you may be inhaling, inhaling it. Use uh, your containers should be cleaned after they've been used and dispose of product containers after they are empty by putting them in the garbage. Okay, the, the next one is Spinosad. This is a biological product that is made from two natural substances that a soil bacterium uh, forms. It does affect the nervous system of insects like thrips, spider mites, ants, fruit flies, and uh, some other things. Uh, it's found as a pre-mixed spray, as a concentrate to be mixed with water. And there are also uh, horticultural soaps with uh, spinosad in them. Um, Pyrethrins are made uh, are found in certain chrysanthemum flowers. They also affect the nervous system of insects. They can be found in a dust form. Using dust, you must be very careful that you do not inhale them. Um, a concentrate can be mixed with water or it can be found pre-mixed. Pyrethroids, know the ending of, notice that the ending of the words are different is a synthetic product and it is very similar to pyrethrins, but is not derived from the flowers. So pyrethrins would be considered an organic and pyrethroids would not. The neem products are becoming one of the things that we go to first for a lot of problems. They've been, a, been used in uh, India for hundreds of years. Um, there are two things that are derived from the neem tree one is um, azadaractin, which is an extract of the tree, mostly the seeds, and it disrupts insect growth and reproductive hormones. So it causes the insect, if you get it on it, for instance, when the insect is small, it causes it not to develop into an adult. It's useful on spider mites, aphids, white flies, caterpillars, and thrips. Neem oil is an insecticide that also comes from the neem tree. Uh, it is an oil, so its main purpose is to block the spiracles of insects. That's the little holes that they breathe through. And it will also control several fungal and bacterial diseases. It's most often found in a concentrate that you can mix with water. Since neem oil is an oil, it would probably mix better with uh, a little bit of warm water, not hot water, warm water. So some of the chemical practices that we can use, these are what we call chemicals. They're the th uh, they are pesticides, but you should use these in a la as a last resort. We're finding more and more the chemical pesticides are showing up in the environment, either through water, uh, wa uh, rains washing them off into places where they're not supposed to be, or just being used indiscriminately. If they are deemed ne uh, necessary, you should target the specific problem again. If you've got spider mites, use one for spider mites. Don't use one for caterpillars. Read the directions, read the directions, read the directions, and then follow them. Be smart and be safe. We cannot emphasize reading directions and following them enough. Indiscriminate use of the pesticides kills your native predators, pollinators, and decomposers, as well as harming other parts of the environment. <clears throat> so as the things that we've talked about, you want to identify your problem or the pest, determine how bad it is. Can you stand it? Can you not stand it? Do you think it's gonna get worse? We want to look at the management problems. Do we need to do nothing? Do we want to 
put out row covers? Do we want to use a, an, an organic pesticide? Do we want to try to decide if we need to use a chemical pro, uh, product? Select one or more options. You might run it by a gardener friend, a, an extension agent, someone on the hotline. Um, measure the success of your options and record the results. There are different ways to record results. A lot of people now have started keeping a gardening journal. If you don't want to do that, um, one of the things you can do is to write down, if you're using a spinosad, for instance, on the container, uh, if you can write on the container, you can write when you use it. It's better to write it on a little card and attach that card to the container. This is when I use it and then go back and write down whether you had good results or not. That way you won't be making uh, the same mistake twice or you'll know that's your go-to product. Okay, this is my favorite part. This is the, these are the beneficial insects in your garden and IPM. There's about a million species of identified insects in the world. About 29,000 have been identified in Texas. And I think about most of those live right here in the Gulf Coast. Scientists estimate that insects make up about 90% of all the animal species on Earth and about half of all living things. Less than 1% of insects are pests, though. And those pests are the ones we're most concerned about most of the time, but we really need to be thinking about the beneficials. Um, the uh, first thing that we need to uh, have you remember is that all insects have to go through a process from the laying the eggs to the hatchlings to the adulthood. Some insects, like the one uh, at uh, the top, go through a process called simple metamorphosis. When the eggs hatch, the babies look a little similar to the adult. They've got legs. Um, they have mouth parts like the adults. They go through processes of um, growing, molting, growing, molting. And they do that for some, some of them do it three or four times. Some of them do it more often. And then they become the adult insect. On others, like the lady beetle, the metamorphosis is, is called complete metamorphosis. The eggs hatch and they look like this, nothing like a lady beetle. And the pupa are the stage where they're growing and waiting, uh, waiting and growing, uh, looks a little bit different. That's the pupa. And then from this pupa, we get the lady beetle. Um, Okay, insects can be decomposers. So we have earwigs. If you dig around in your garden, especially under leaves, you see these little things scurrying around. They don't hurt anything, but they are helping decompose uh, leaves and, and uh, litter that's on the ground. Roaches, if you've lived here very long, you know this, per, this uh, insect well. We don't want them in our house, but they are perfectly fine outdoors. There's several different kinds um, and uh, they are good outdoors because they are decomposers. They eat all kinds of stuff. They eat dead insects, they eat, they eat leaves, they do all sorts of things that help in the decomposing process. Um, the um, caterpillar uh, in the hand, and that's not exaggerated, it's that big, uh, is the caterpillar of an ox beetle. The beetle is also large. People see the large beetle, they're a little bit scared of it. They dig up this, this grub that looks like this. They wanna get rid of it, but they don't cause problems. They are eating leaf litter, decomposing, uh, that sort of thing. If you notice when we talked about um, the uh, spiracles, the little holes on the side uh, of the uh, insects, this is what they are on this caterpillar. Uh, you can see those and that's what, if you're, working with pests, that's what you want to plug up. Uh, termites are also good decomposers as long as they're not in our house. And the flesh flies, we don't notice too much because they lay their eggs on um, dead animals. Uh, and uh, we often don't see those. Uh, the dead, the uh, immatures are called maggots. 
but they're very important in uh, decomposing that sort of thing. Crane fly is pretty important uh, because uh, it's uh, not because of it's a fly, but because of the uh, larva that's in the grass. It eats thatch and other dead uh, parts of grasses in, of the grass in our lawn. Uh, you can tell this one is a fly because it only has one pair of wings and it's got a set of halteres, little balancing organisms right there. Um, the, the adult crane fly doesn't eat much of anything, but the larva does. Uh, bark lice are things that people see. I included them because people see them and don't understand them. Uh, they're often in a herd uh, on a plant, uh, usually on a tree. Um, and uh, if we look at them up close, they look like something in the picture on the left. They are, uh, if you disturb the herd, they scatter, uh, but then eventually they'll come back together. They're eating things like um, lichens, fungus, maybe dead parts, uh, bark on the tree, that sort of thing. Uh, and sometimes they make a web. Um, the web should not be disturbed as long as the insects are under there. Most of the time they will take care of the web themselves. They either eat it or destroy it. So you don't have to worry about that. It is, the web is not a disease. It's protection for the bark lice. Another insect we don't see too much, but they're out there are the dung beetles and they, they lay their eggs in a bottle, in a, a ball of dung. Uh, so uh, they're important, probably not as important in cities as they are in the, the countryside. So insects that are predators, uh, we're familiar with the dragonfly and the praying mantis. The um, dragonfly itself flies through the air and with those legs with spines all over them, they uh, are able to catch insects as they're flying through the air and they eat those. Their um, nymph lives in water and it also feeds on insects and small creatures and it takes a year, maybe more for this uh, nymph to develop into a, a, a dragonfly. The praying mantid, uh, a lot of times they're there, we don't see them. Uh, they can be very still, they blend in with uh, their surroundings. Uh, they, uh, the female lays an egg case that's called an ootheca, and uh, it has hundreds of eggs in it. When the babies hatch, they are very, very tiny. When a praying mantis has a spot in their your yard that they like, a place where they are able to catch insects to eat, don't try to move it. Let it move on its own because sometimes if you move it, they, they don't like that at all. This is also an insect you can buy um, when you release them or you put the egg cases out. Uh, they may stay in your garden, but remember if there's not enough to eat, they're gonna go somewhere else. Lacewing, we don't see these too often, but the adults, um, but um, they're, they are very important predators. The um, uh, eggs are laid on a stalk, uh, and when they hatch, they, uh, they are protected somewhat because they're on that stalk right when they hatch. Uh, since they're predators, they will eat their brothers and sisters, so they wanna scurry away as fast as they can. This is an example uh, of the nymphs, uh, the little tiger, uh, little alligator looking insect with the big claws is a, um, um, a, a lace wing nymph. And the uh, one on the right is uh, one that has covered himself up with probably the uh, fluff from mealy bugs or maybe white flies white fly larva, that sort of thing. So sometimes if you're looking at the ground and you see a tiny little piece of trash moving, um, that would be uh, a lacewing nymph. Um, the milkweed, uh, yes. the spine soldier bug is looks like a stink bug. It is a stink bug, but it's not a bad stink bug. Those 
the shoulders on it uh, tell you that it's the good one and it is a predator of other insects. The assassin bug is um, found uh, all over our gardens. This one is called the milkweed assassin bug. It is has a long uh, piercing mouth part and it can eat uh, whatever it catches. Uh, sometimes they try to, they catch very large insects, very tiny when they're young. And um, the, uh, and then this is a, still a nymph, no wings. This is the one with the wings. Their eggs are always laid in sort of a, a geometric form. Um, the wheel bug, um, is large, a very large bug. It's got this dinosaur-like wheel on its back. You can see it's a uh, piercing mouth part. These are good. They kind of lumber around. If they're flying, they they make a lot of noise, but those are good ones to keep in your garden. Paper wasp. Nobody likes them because they, they sting, but the paper wasp are, uh, are very important predators. They have to feed their babies. If you look in that paper nest that the wasp made, you can see some little white dots. Those are their eggs. They will provision those cells with tiny insects, could be a spider mite, could be a, a larva of some kind, um, could be a spider. Uh, and then uh, they will cover that over once the larva has reached a certain stage and the larva will be able to eat that. Uh, we have several kinds of wasp in the neighborhood. I wouldn't leave a paper wasp nest over the back door, but if it's out in your garden somewhere and it can stay there, that's that would uh, be okay. Uh, mud daubers, we don't like them either because they make nests on our house, but they are wonderful pred predators also. Um, so if you can uh, manage that, uh, manage to leave some of those, that would be good for your garden. Uh, if you can think about it, the paper, the uh, mud dauber has to make their nest, however big it is, how, whatever shape it's in, out of mouthfuls of mud. A lot of these are solitary, so one, uh, either a pair of insects or one of them will be making the nest by going somewhere, getting mud by the mouthful, bringing it back and bringing it back. And if you watch them very much, you know they can do that pretty fast. This is a little wasp at the bottom called an ensign wasp. Um, you might see these in your house or in your garage or maybe in another structure. They're outdoors too, but they're kind of hard to see. You might think they're a little cricket uh, walking on the ground or a spider if you see them walking around in your house. They have kind of jerky movements. They're called ensign wasps because their abdomen is shaped sort of like the... Uh, the flag that a, a sailor uses. Um, they lay their eggs on cockroach eggs, egg cases. Um, they uh, will eat, the larva will, or the, the larva will eat all of the eggs in a case. So they are very good for controlling those. If you see them in your house, if you see a lot of ensign wasp in your house, you may have a cockroach problem. If you just see one or two, please let them back outdoors. This is a potter wasp. They make a little pot out of mud. You might have seen it on your house, on the screen, um, on a twig. Leave those, that's one little wasp. And look at all the caterpillars that came out of these two little pots, a lot of them. And I think that most of those were uh, sod webworm caterpillars. The red and black mason wasp is pretty common. They like to hang around where there are uh, stalks or these are bamboo. Uh, uh, pieces of bamboo. They make their nests in the in the the holes by bringing in uh, sandy grit, that sort of thing. They make little cells that they put uh, in, uh, other insects in, little insects in to feed their larva. The uh, little wasp coming out of the cocoon that's on the right is a braconid wasp. Uh, they're very very tiny. Uh, this caterpillar is a tomato gardener's nightmare because they they can eat a tomato a lot off of a tomato plant in one night. They usually feed at night, um, and this little wasp will lay its eggs on this caterpillar, 
and the, uh, they will eat the inside of the caterpillar, then make the cocoons on the outside. So it would be to our advantage to leave that one in the garden. It's not eating at that stage. It's not eating anything in your, your garden anymore. And then you will have all of those little braconid wasps that have been uh, released into your garden. By the way, a good way to find uh, hornworms, they are kind of hard to find, is to look on the ground uh, or around the, the plant and you will see their, their big uh, black droppings. Another way is to take a child, a five, six-year-old, four-year-old can find these a lot quicker than adults can. Beetles are helpful. Uh, we see a lot of ground beetles around here. A lot of them hunt at night. Uh, the little tiger beetles, if you look out, turn on your porch out and look outside, sometimes you'll see these scurrying around. They all move fast. Um, they all have very powerful jaws, not just the one in the middle. All the rest of them have uh, powerful jaws. They hunt at night. They eat adult insects and their larvae. And um, they uh, might, if you squish them or if you... Uh, bother them, they may emit an odor. They, um, the ground beetle, uh, the ground beetle's larva is, um, looks like a little, sort of like a little worm. They're called wire worms. This is the tiger beetle larva. larva. The lady beetles, uh, one of everybody's favorites. They don't always, they're not always uh, red with black spots. These two are Asian lady beetles. They are not native, but we have a lot of those now. This is one. Um, and uh, you can usually tell a lady beetle because when they're still and just resting, they don't show much leg. Uh, the eggs look something like this on the uh, left, but so do a lot of other beetle eggs. Uh, eggs look the same. The, um, the, the nymph is this little alligator looking thing. Some of them may be different and the pupa has got, is, has that orange coloration on most of them and, uh, and some black spots. This is a tiny little lady beetle that you probably will never see, but you may see the nymphs. They look like mealybugs, but they are busy eating aphids. Um, you can see these are the, uh, see the aphids and then see the, uh, the uh, larva and uh, kind of uh, guess what the size is. The beetle is, this is a, an aphid up at the top and the, the lady beetle is not much, uh, not much bigger. Flies, we have the taconid flies. They have bristles on them. They lay eggs on caterpillars. The robber fly catches things. This is a big larva, a uh, big uh, robber fly and it's eating a big horse fly. Uh, the long-legged flies are the little metallic ones you see on leaves. Forward flies, very interesting. That's a good one for you to look up. There's even a video to watch. This little fly uh, lays its eggs on the head of fire ants, and the egg develops in the fire ant head and causes the fire ant to die. Uh, there are some videos that show that happening. Uh, surfed flies are little flies that lay their eggs on um, um, uh, uh, plants, and then they hatch, they lay them among uh, aphids, they hatch, they go through several stages. As you can see by the, the size of the aphids and the, the larvae, they're not very big. Washing things off with uh, water kind of destroys those. We have many kinds of bees here, many native bees. The leaf cutter bees, some people don't like because it cuts little circles out of the leaves. Uh, the resin bee um, makes its nest in the ground. Uh, the uh, sweat bee uh, is, they're different metallic colors. Uh, these are all good pollinators. So we wanna be sure that we keep them in the garden. We've got other garden friends like bluebirds, um, their little annals, frogs, spiders, uh, snakes. Um, most of the snakes we have here are not, not problematic. Okay, Dan, I am going to, I hope, unshare. Um, here we go. Okay, and I will try and share, see how we do here. Uh, can I 
uh, just before you start, Dan, Nancy, there is a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Is there a specific parasite for the leaf footed uh, stink bugs? They are wrecking havoc on my vegetables. I don't, uh, we'd have to, have to look that up. I don't know if there is a parasite or a parasitic wasp or anything in particular for that. And yes, the uh, leaf footed bugs are awful. Looking for their eggs on your house before they hatch, they, they lay their eggs on people's houses a lot. It's a long string of eggs. Uh, the um, um, the uh, nymphs all stay together because they eat plants. They don't eat each other. So they'll stay together for a long time. You can destroy them like that. Uh, I think probably a pesticide uh, like maybe spinosad would work, but I don't know of a parasitic one. I can look that up while uh, Dan's talking, though. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Nancy talked about uh, good guys. I'm going to tell you some, give you some information about some of the harmful insects or pests. Uh, Nancy mentioned aphids. There are all many different species of aphids. Uh, they typically feed on the young growth and they produce honeydew, which is a sugary excrement that uh, when it falls on lower leaves, like on this crepe myrtle, uh, a fungus called sooty mold grows and that will hurt the plant. It's also rather unsightly for the plant. Um, those that grow citrus are probably familiar with citrus leaf miners, and it's actually the larva of a small moth. And they dig their way through the leaves, uh, randomly making tunnels, uh, and then emerge as adults to uh, pass it on. There's other leaf miners that uh, are moths. There's also uh, leaf miners that are the larvae of tiny flies. Uh, and they can be a pest on various ornamental plants as well. Leaf hoppers are, and I guess I mentioned uh, the aphids are piercing sucking, so they're gonna they're going to be sucking the sap out of the plant. Uh, leaf hoppers will do the same. Uh, this is a nymph, and then these are adults. Um, if there's not a serious infestation, uh, the plant will be okay, but if it's a serious inf infestation, uh, the plants will will suffer pretty pretty badly. Spider mites aren't insects, but we do include them. Uh, they're typically found on the underside of the leaves, uh, and Nancy mentioned them. This is a tomato plant that's been pretty well uh, overcome with them. They make webs to help protect themselves, and uh, a good way uh, that Ma Nancy mentioned is to get a spray hose and uh, hose underneath the leaves to knock them off and do that every few days, and that upsets their life cycle. White flies are pretty common anymore. Typically, you see them uh, when you go out and disturb the plant, they fly, they fly off. Uh, typically, they're found on the underside of the leaves and also uh, will suck plant juices. Uh, they also have the honeydew excrement or similar, uh, and that can lead to uh, sooty mold on plants from uh, white fly infestation as well. There's many types of scale. Uh, this shows a few of them. Um, you can see by this pen that they're, they are very small, um, and the scale will also produce uh, honeydew, and in fact, there are some species of ants that will farm the scale and harvest the honeydew uh, of, from the scale, and that helps the scale because there's not going to be any sooty mold growing, so the plant's going to be healthy and they're going to have more to eat. And it helps, of course, it helps the in, feed the insect, the, the ants. Uh, crepe myrtle bark scale is, is becoming more prominent. Um, and typically for scale, since there's 
a hard exoskeleton. Uh, a lot of times neem oil, uh, oil like neem oil is used. Um, there's also cycad scale, uh, in this case on a sago palm. Uh, and again, these are pretty serious infections, but uh, as Nancy mentioned, you want to monitor on them and if it gets this bad, it's time to do something. There are many caterpillars. Um, caterpillars will grow up to be either moths in this case or butterflies. Uh, most of the butterflies we like seeing, uh, many of the caterpillars are, uh, many of the moth caterpillars are pests. Uh, cabbage looper, you probably know that. Uh, it, Looks like an inchworm, the way it uh, crawls, um, affecting cabbage and other plants. Uh, fall armyworm and sod webworm, uh, typically in the in the fall, affecting uh, various uh, fall armyworm uh, lawns and and other plants, and of course the sod webworm. Uh, the sod webworm feeds at typically feeds at night and uh, can be controlled as well. Uh, Nancy mentioned the uh, tobacco hornworm. Uh, this one is not, uh, has not been attacked by a bracketed wasp. Uh, the, the bad thing is that it, it actually turns into a pretty, kind of a pretty moth, uh, typically called a hawk moth. Uh, however, as Nancy said, they, they will devastate tomato plants. Um, you can go out uh, one night and your tomato plant's fine, you go back the next morning and there's a foot wide gap up where there's no leaves anymore. And that's a pretty telltale sign. Some uh, small caterpillars will disguise themselves like we saw with uh, the uh, other larvae. Uh, but most of those aren't going to do much harm. If you've ever seen uh, an asp, uh, and this is the moth of the uh, asp caterpillar, uh, do not handle them. They will give you a nasty sting. Um, other than that, they're, they're not too devastating, but they, they do give a nasty sting. Uh, forest tent caterpillars and fall webworms. Uh, we'll make nets, uh, form a web around uh, where they are in the tree. And if, again, if there's, unless the tree is covered with them, uh, they're not going to do too, they're not going to really damage the tree. Uh, one thing that you can do if you have a stick long enough, a broom or something, if you can reach up and break open that webbing, uh, that will open it up so that Wasps and other predators will go get them for you. Squash vine borer has uh, been a, become a pest uh, of late. Uh, the adult, which kind of looks like a, a wasp, but it's really it really is a uh, a moth, uh, lays its egg on or near the squash vine, the egg hatches and bores inside where it will eat away at the inside and that uh, will cut off the flow of nutrients uh, to the plant and you'll probably lose that vine. Uh, squash bugs, uh, here we send the, uh, the larvae. Uh, again, they'll do uh, damage um uh, as well a uh, leaf-footed bug is named for its hind leg that is wide and very thin uh here you can see you can look right through it but from the other angle it looks like a little leaf um <clears throat> they are pests typically uh with the exception perhaps of the uh, bark aphids. Uh, when you see a group of insects, they're typically pests because, uh, as Nancy mentioned, typically predators are feeding on whatever they can find. And if these were predators, they would be eating each other. The leaf-footed bug lays a characteristic line 
of eggs and they'll hatch uh, into these bright orange nymphs. Um, and then uh, will emerge as these adults. They do puncture uh, plants and they will also puncture fruit, uh, damaging them and perhaps causing secondary infection as well from a disease or, or other pest. Stink bugs, Nancy mentioned one uh, that was beneficial, the spine soldier bug. Uh, and again, you can tell because it's got the, uh, the spines on its shoulders, if you will. Uh, but there are a number of stink bugs that are pests, including the southern, southern green stink bug and the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, they will puncture into plants and pods and feed on the nutrients in the seed and cause uh, pretty good damage on the plants. There are a number of beetle pests. Um, the calligraphy beetle is kind of mostly uh, perhaps Western, uh, but it is found around here. The beetle and the larvae uh, will feed on plants. Uh, the swamp milkweed beetle, um, and here's the adult, and you can see they've pretty much cleaned that milkweed plant, and that's not, uh, they have to eat too, but uh, typically we're trying to save our milkweed plants to feed the monarchs that come by. So milkweed beetles, not, not a good thing. Uh, flea beetles will, will damage uh, feed on leaves as well. Uh, you're probably familiar with cucumber beetles. Uh, there's several different types, uh, typically black and yellow. Uh, they again, they will also feed on uh, plants as well as fruit. Uh, and I've even seen them in roses feeding on the petals. Galls, uh, galls on plants are, are not necessarily bad. They're, they're somewhat unsightly. They can be on the leaves or the stems. Uh, typically they're caused by tiny wasps and the wasp will lay its egg on the leaf or stem and something as the egg, when the egg hatches causes the, the plant to form cells around it to form the gall. Uh, and then the young uh, the larva of the wasp then feeds off the nutrients within those cells inside the gall. Uh, typically, they're very small and they really don't do much damage other than they might be a little unsightly. Galls, the ones that affect the leaves, typically, uh, unless it's evergreen, the leaves are going to fall off in the fall anyway. Um, and again, even if they're on the stem or branch, they're, they're not going to do that much damage. Okay, hey, want to look at some diseases. Um, diseases are <clears throat> various organisms that cause plants to grow abnormally. Uh, they may include viruses, bacteria, fungi, or nematodes. Uh, various symptoms include stunted growth, uh, various spots in the leaf, stem decay, distorted leaves, uh, discoloration of the leaves, uh, as well as discoloration or distortion of the fruit and flowers. Uh, it's good to uh, keep track of them and so that we can prevent or control them. Uh, also, as Man Nancy mentioned, you want to scout and you want to make sure that it's actually a disease and not an insect that's causing the damage. Okay, some fungal diseases include powdery mildew. And uh, powdery mildew causes a growth that's similar to uh, little strands of cotton. Uh, can be devastating. Um, uh, as Nancy mentioned, if you can, you can, if there's damaged leaves, you can pluck them off, and, but do discard, discard them. Um, sooty mold, we mentioned uh, in response to the 
honeydew from from the aphids and white flies. Uh, probably most people are familiar with brown patch. Um, it's going to be that time of year. Uh, typically in a oval or circular type uh, damage in the lawn, uh, these can be treated. And I'll let you check with your check with the uh, hotline for specifics. Uh, black spot on roses. Um, typically on roses, uh, they're sprayed to prevent the formation of fun fungal uh, problems like black spot. Um, you can also use resistant varieties. Uh, much easier than having to, to spray. A lot of the old old garden roses are resistant, uh, as well as many new varieties. Hey, Dan, would you like the questions to be asked now, or do you want me to wait till the end? Either way is fine. Okay, somebody had a question about uh, their big crepe myrtle tree, and they say that it is it suffers from serious scale attack and they can't spray anything because the tree is so big and they want to know how they can stop the disease from spreading to other trees, plants close by. Wow. Um, <laughs> Either you or Nancy, whoever wants to answer. Nancy, you want that one? Um, I think about the only thing you can do for it is uh, the thing that makes a tree look so bad is the sooty mold that grows around them because the insect is actually white, but the sooty mold is black. They are very, very prolific. Um, you can use uh, horticultural oils, but I would check with uh, somebody who knows, maybe somebody uh, on the hotline can look that up for you um, to, uh, it will actually smother them. Um, these uh, are showing up more and more around, uh, so I'm afraid we may be losing some of our crepe myrtles to that. Um, so I would check with Hotline on what you can do to get it off. Real quick, there's another thing about getting um, the white stuff off of lemon tree leaves. If you look on the, if they're on, it's on the bottom of the leaf, it's probably a buildup of white fly larva or uh, shed skin, something like that. If it's got a little black mixed in with it, that's the sooty mold. You just have to, you have to wash that off. And I know if you've got citrus trees, that may be too much. Um, it, it's not good for the tree. It probably will not kill the tree. Neem oil would probably be something you could use. It may not remove the white stuff. And neem oil and other oils are uh, best used when it's a little cooler. Uh, so, what else was I going to mention? Um, hmm. Forgot it already. Darn it. <laughs> okay. A any other questions for the moment? Yeah. So, somebody asked uh, their whole garden suffers from nematodes. Can you recommend any treatment? <laughs> Nem nematodes are tough. Go ahead, Nancy. No, I was going to mute myself. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like I said, ne nematodes are tough because they're they're present in the soil, and there's there's actually beneficial nematodes as well. And as with other beneficial insects, uh, there are some places, and I and I dread to think what the cost might be that where you could get beneficial nematodes. Whether or not they would help uh, would would be debatable as well because trying to get them mixed in into the soil where they could do their job would be pretty tough. Yeah, I do know that we have a master gardener who had that problem. So if you would put that in a question to the hotline, uh, we could maybe try to get in touch with him and see what he did because he did uh, solve the problem. Okay. Okay, any others? Yeah, uh, black spots on basil and the whole plant died. Time, time for a new plant. 
um, again, with with vegetables and and other plants, they're they're breeding them for resistance to various diseases and uh, problems as well. So uh, when you select when when you get your plant, try to make sure that they're resistant. Yeah, that and watering. If you if you leave water on leaves, then you're asking for trouble. So water in the mornings, uh, and so that the plant can dry off pretty quick. Don't water at night because um, it could be something related to that. Yeah, especially uh, many diseases like like moist, warm uh, conditions. Uh, also, going going back quick to the crepe myrtle. Uh, Typically, insects and diseases will attack weak plants, so uh, it it may be a matter of uh, not enough fertilizer. But that said, keep in mind that you can also over fertilize and cause problems. Any other Suma? I think uh, that's it for now. Okay, uh, I guess let, let me know if, when another one. Shows okay, up. thank you. All right, thanks. <clears throat> okay, another fungal disease is uh, Entomosporium leaf spot, uh, typical on uh, Fotinia and ha Indian hawthorn. Uh, as you can see, it starts with brown spots on the leaves, uh, and then they get reddish and purple edges. Sometimes it gets so bad the leaves are going to fall off. Um, if that happens, you want to rake them up and, and dispose of them because they will have the disease organism on them and uh, more likely to spread the disease even more. Uh, it typically occurs in the spring, uh, damp weather, and again, overhead sprinklers are going to contribute to that. When you water, you want to water, as Nancy said, in the morning. Uh, that way, the leaves are going to dry off during the day. If you would, if you water at night, the leaves, the water stay, stays on the leaves. It's wet. That's perfect conditions for diseases. Um, <clears throat> again, to to control, uh, as I mentioned, clean up the leaves. Uh, don't don't water in at, at night. And uh, again, there are resistant varieties available. Okay, there are bacterial diseases as well. Uh, crown gall is one uh, causing galls or tumorous growths uh, on the stem, typically near the soil line or sometimes on branches as well. Um, if the gall gets big enough, they're going to inter interfere with nutrient and water movement in the stem or, or root, uh, and the plant will suffer from it. The disease is systemic, and what that means is once it's in the plant, it's in the plant. Um, let me go back a moment. Uh, a fung fungal disease like uh, the leaf spot, uh, it's typically on the outside of the plant. And so, so it can be spread by spores and all, but it's not. it typically doesn't spread to other parts of that plant. Um, unless the spores are spread in and it grows. Uh, syst a systemic disease uh, is, is likely to occur anywhere on the plant. Um, the best way to, to avoid that is to uh, look at plants when you get them, make, make sure that they're healthy. Um, if they do get it, um, it's, it's very tough to control. There's also a bacterial spot uh, that, are, that affects tomatoes and peppers. Uh, the leaves, as you can see, they'll have uh, spots that have yellow halos or rings around them. Uh, fruit will have brown spots, again, with yellow rings around them. Uh, the fruit may also have uh, spots and begin to rot, as you can kind of see on the top of this uh, pepper. Uh, it's typical in times of high temperatures and high humidity. And again, uh, overhead watering will 
uh, increase the chances of spread and the disease. So again, water, water everything in the morning. <clears throat> there are some viral diseases, a uh, couple more common ones, uh, tobacco mosaic virus uh, seen here on uh, tomato, uh, which is closely, closely related. Um, it causes a modeling or uh, non-distinct pattern of yellowing in the leaves and can also affect the fruit. <clears throat> uh, here it's shown on rows, and you can see that, uh, again, it's going to uh, uh, affect the, the leaves uh, with yellowing. Uh, with a virus, uh, typically viruses are spread by insects, but they can also be spread by hand tools. So uh, if you are pruning your roses, uh, and certainly if you see something like this on the rose and you haven't uh, corrected it, you'll want to uh, <clears throat> clean, your, clean your pruners between each plant so that you don't spread that virus to another plant. Okay, rose rosette disease is a virus uh, transmitted by microscopic mite. It causes very bunchy growth, very abnormal. Excuse me. Almost like a witch's broom. There's really no treatment. Excuse me. <coughs> Nancy? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, for rose rosette disease, I'm seeing several things in the uh, chat about that. There is no cure for this. I don't know how we convince people of that. It affects knockout roses. It seems worse than others, and but it can affect other roses also. Uh, you've got to destroy it. I know it's not easy. You can't keep cutting it off and cutting it down. You've got to destroy <laughs> it in a garbage bag, put the garbage bag in the in a can. Don't keep spreading this to your neighbors or to anybody else. Um, there's nothing you can spray on it to get rid of it. These little mites are airborne. They're going to keep coming and going. So, um, sorry about that, but that's right now. That's the only thing to do. <clears throat> okay, let me, let me try again. Thank you. And, and yes, it's important to get it out before, uh, other plants are infected. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Aster yellows is a disease <clears throat> that's present throughout the plant and it's caused by caused by a phytoplasma yes. that's transmitted by leaf hoppers. Um, again, the leaf it doesn't affect leaf hoppers, but they transmit it from plant to plant. It causes unusual flowering. Um, it places you don't expect blooms to come, for example, like this coming coming out of a another bloom or uh, multiple bloom multiple blooms uh, in uh, strange areas. Um, <clears throat> probably you want to, uh, you probably have to get rid of that plant as, as well. Okay, and then the last one we're going to look at is uh, root knot nematodes as an example of nematodes. Uh, nematodes are microscopic roundworms, and we already had a question on them. Um, <clears throat> they will affect the root. So here's a microscope microscope slide of one infecting, uh, attacking a root. Um, when they attack it, it causes nodules to form, hence the, the knots uh, that we, they refer to. <laughs> and uh, again, we need a contact extension agent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cool. 
Sorry, that is our, that is, I believe, our last slide. And again. Do we want to do chat questions again? Sure, sure. Um, wow. So some, somebody is asking, is it bad to eat the vegetables that are uh, impacted by the tobacco mosaic virus, like eating a tomato that is affected by it? Okay, I'm going to go and I'm... <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and unshare. Uh, um, oh, I don't think it is um, bad to eat it if the fruit is okay, if it tastes okay. I don't think it's bad to eat it. Okay. So I cannot even pronounce this, but somebody asked in May, can you drench around the crepe myrtle with imidi, imidi chlori period? Uh, is that a uh, systemic in insecticide? Uh, from Joe Russo. Joe Russo, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, I've always been told, and I've, I've looked it up, that you can, um, in around May, you can do a drenching around the, uh, around the water line of these crepe myrtles with what I mentioned that would prevent that crepe myrtle from uh, acquiring sooty mold. Oh, I don't, I don't know about the city mold. I thought you were talking about the, uh, the, uh, crepe myrtle scale. Um, and no, it was sooty mold. They they specifically okay. said sooty mold and I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know about that. Um, okay. I would check with somebody else, uh, maybe with a county agent or something. Uh, if it's a systemic, uh, in, uh, then it would be taken up by the would have to be taken up by the plant. That's exactly that. the case. That's yeah. exactly the case. It's taken uh, up by the plant. But I don't know if that works that way. So you okay. would have to, you'd have to check with someone else. I'll check with Boone. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. The other thing about sy systemics is that um, they're not necessarily directed at a at the particular pest you have. Uh, they're typically more broad spectrum. Um, and in particular, when you get to like a fertilizer um, disease control combination, uh, that's that's systemic. Thanks, Dan. So Nancy and Dan, uh, is there any other presentation that's that goes deeper into specific diseases and how to resolve those issues? Like in Grow Your Own, are we talking about it or? Uh, I don't know it. Uh, like I said earlier, this, uh, we could do something on diseases. We could do something on beneficial insects. We could do another one on harmful insects. There's just a lot to cover here. Uh, so I don't know of any specific thing. If you have identified your pest, uh, you can look on, you can put it in, the, uh, send it into the hotline. Uh, you can also send a picture and we can help you identify it. Uh, you can also look online. I would advise you when you look online to go to, um, to uh, TAMU AgriLife Extension, uh, use a land grant university. University of Florida has a lot of good information. University of North Carolina. Um, the states that are in the Southeast have generally the same problems that we do. So those are good places to look for help. Um, you can't depend on, uh, I mean, there's a ton of stuff out there on diseases and what and insects and what you can do, but they're all not real, really good. Uh, the, uh, so I, I would just research it very carefully before you use anything. Uh, sometimes descriptions that we give and sometimes descriptions that you give are not exactly the same in words. So pictures really, really do, do help. Uh, somebody asked those if is it true that citrus fruits that come back that came back from the freeze will not fruit. They probably won't. They may not fruit next year if they are coming back 
below their graft, which would be like a bump on the, the stump close to the ground, they may not, they probably will not come back true to what you planted, especially if you see a little stalk that's got three little leaves, the, the leaf is broken up into three parts. Um, that is the, uh, the grafting stalk and you don't want to keep it. It will have thorns and uh, produce, uh, won't produce fruit uh, like you had anyway. Um, citrus trees, I keep seeing this about leaf miners, leaf miners, leaf miners. You're going to have them. Uh, they don't hurt your citrus. Uh, they look awful, but they don't generally hurt your citrus uh, very much. One thing you can do is clean up when the leaves come off. Um, you can clean those up so that you don't have anything overwintering. Um, you can squish that little larva that's in the leaf, but you've got a lot of leaves to, to, to work on. Uh, you can spray with neem oil early before they get on the tree, but you have to do it often. Uh, you would need to look that up. I think it's every five to 10 days, uh, which is kind of broad. Uh, you would need to spray to keep those off. But I think in our climate, those little, um, uh, the little moth is gonna be around all the time. And uh, we have so many people in our neighborhoods that are growing citrus that it's really hard to, to get rid of those. We do have some other citrus diseases that we're a little more concerned about, citrus greening and um, what's the other one? There's a couple that, that we're really more concerned about, which puts our county under a uh, quarantine, actually, um, for removing trees from our count, from taking trees out of our county. Um, uh, you might want to check on that too, uh, citrus greening and... Sorry, I can't think of the other one right now. Can't think of it either. Yeah. Um, well, Nancy, mm -hmm. do we do we have uh, some more of those card decks available for sale? Yes. Uh, do we do we make them available during our veggie sale on October 9th? Uh, I think they probably will be. Uh, let me see if I can share again and I will, whoops, wrong thing. Because that may help people to get to the specific pests and specific solutions. Yes, um, I can. And the other one is uh, Chinu has just posted citrus canker disease. <clears throat> yeah, that's the other one. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. We have vegetable cards that tell you about pests. We have. That's, that's um, really useful. Yeah, butterfly. Things for people who want to, uh, cards for people who want to to uh, garden for butterflies. That's another talk. <laughs> we have, awesome. yeah, we have some benef uh, beneficial insect cards, little sets. Uh, they're on a ring. Uh, they're not waterproof. They're water resistant, but they're good to look to look at for help and identification. Um, okay, Joe says that water is not a problem on on basil, so it could be something else. I believe it's Joe. No, that's not Joe. From Carol, said it's. It could be uh, a seed, a genetic problem. Could be in the seeds. I'm not sure about that. I do know that water is a big pro. Water on leaves is a big problem in this part of the country. Uh, the parasites for leaf-footed bugs is a feather-footed fly. I don't think you can purchase it. Pyrethrins are recommended. Um, and uh, people can unmute themselves to ask questions. I have two questions. Number one, where do you get the cards you were just showing us? And then with the leaf hoppers, 
how do you know that where's the line drawn between they're an issue and they're not an issue, particularly on citrus? Go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, well, my citrus froze, but um, it, it's really up to you. I mean, um, you, you don't want them to decrease your yield too much. And so if, if they're, you know, they're, you've got branches that are dying or, or large areas, then you, you probably would want to control them. Yeah, the, the citrus psyllid, P-S-Y-L-L-I-D, uh, spreads disease, a bad disease in citrus. It looks a little bit like a, a leaf-footed bug. Um, so you might wanna be sure that it's, it's not that. Um, but I think that if you wanted to spray something, you would use neem oil, probably would be the best, uh, best thing. Oh, and uh, she asked where we can get the cards. Oh, the cards, I, I believe they'll be on sale at the, um, at the plant sale, but you can also call ahead uh, and uh, you can purchase them. We can have some ready for you. You can purchase them at the extension office. Any other questions? Yes, if you're a slow typer like like me, you can unmute and answer the, ask the question. Yeah, that's better. Uh, this is a statement from somebody. There is so, she's got a bunch of O's, much on the internet. It's hard to know what works best in our area. She is definitely right. There are all kinds of things out there that work. There are all kinds of things out there that don't work. Uh, basically, what we told you today is just is uh, the basic things that you would start with. The key thing is identifying what the problem is because you don't want to treat for something that you don't have. So I do not know, somebody, uh, Larry has posted, for root not nematodes, practice strict garden rotation, plant only tomatoes with a EN, example VFN, plant Elborn rye in October and till it in January. Those are his. That is recommended. Yeah. Uh, so everybody who registered for this presentation will get a link for the video uh, as soon as it's ready. Because uh, several people asked that. Okay. If there aren't any more questions, um then in that case thank you all for coming to our workshop thank you nancy and dan for your time and for, for your expertise um and thank you everyone else um our next event in the series is going to be on october 26th at 2 p.m it is the um fruit trees for the backyard is that correct suma yes that's correct so fruit trees for the backyard is in october and then the last one will be trees, planting trees. Yes, the fruit tree one would be really good to watch because uh, we've talked about the citrus trees and there are some uh, other insects and um, uh, pests, uh, diseases that affect a lot of citrus trees in our, or a lot of trees in our area. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So you can start registering for all of these events one month before uh, the actual event. 
That means that for the October 26th one, you can begin registering at www.fortbend.lib.tx.us. Uh, drop that in the chat on, to, and you can start registering for that on September 26th in a few days. Uh, other than that, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Suma, for all of your help. And thank you, Nancy and Dan again, of course. Welcome. And everyone else who helped out today. It was really great. It takes a village. Thank you for the great partnership, Christina. It's really great. It's really fun collaborating with y'all. All right, I'm mm -hmm. going to stop the recording.